Welcome everyone. Today we are privileged to have amongst us Mr. Kunal Basu. His work cuts through the layers of conventional historical fiction and elucidates pertinent issues of those times. He carefully interweaves romance and history and takes us to the vanishing times, connecting India with various countries he has traveled to. He juggles between Bengali and English as his medium of literary expression. He was born to a bibliophile mother and a publisher father and spent his childhood in the company of who's who of literary and political world. His research on CSR and many other research journals in various Ivy Leagues have contributed significantly to the field of academia. His book, The Japanese Wife, has a film by the renowned filmmaker Aparna Sen to its credit. He currently teaches in Oxford University. Mr. Basu has donned many hats and has had a vibrant career path. A fiery academician, a reflective author, a daft journalist, and a passionate filmmaker. Let's give it up for the multi-talented Kunal Basu. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. It's an absolute privilege and honor to have Mr. Basu with us today. Hello, Kunal. Welcome to Udaipur. Hi. So, two of your books talk about Udaipur. Did you conceive Udaipur in them as a part of your book's milieu, or do you have a personal connect with Udaipur? Well, first of all, a very warm thank you to Right Circle for inviting me to their. Um, yes, I do have a special connection to, to Daipur, um, and the most significant one is this book. So my second novel, The Miniaturist, is about Indian miniature art. And of course, Udaipur is the most preeminent center for Indian miniature art. So with your permission, do you, should I say a few words about this book and, and read from it? It'll be a great honor. Okay. Uh, this novel is set in the 16th century in the reign of Emperor Akbar in Fatehpur Sikri. And it tells the story of a young boy called Behzad, who's a child wonder, an amazingly gifted artist, a child prodigy, and everybody expects that he will one day grow up to become Akbar's main artist. But like all gifted people, all gifted young people, he's rebellious. He wants to do things his way. He doesn't really obey his teacher. And his teacher, is a very strict man, a Persian master who has come to Mughal Hindustan called Mir Said Ali. Now, Behzad is illiterate. His father has deliberately not sent him to school because he wants him to grow up as an artist and nothing else but an artist. So the small section that I will read to you is an interaction between him, Behzad, and his teacher. From the fort to the western gate, Behzad walked with Nikisa to Mir Said Ali's studio, memorizing the story of Khasru and Shirin. Then he took his place before his teacher. A sheet of ivory paper on his raised knee. Yet, he drew not the lovers, not the scene, favorite among artists down all the ages of a besotted Shirin admiring Kostru's portrait hung from the branch of a tree. Seated on a cushion of fragrant leaves, as was the custom, under the vivid whiteness of the blossoms in sharp contrast to a fastidiously drawn sky. Nor the forbidden glimpse of a bathing princess, Shirin naked to her waist, a lotus floating on a lake. Mir Said Ali's students had pried open his old album, breasts half submerged in silver. How did their teacher's strict gaze behold his own creation? They had sniggered. How could his gnarled fingers have added a touch of blush to the secretly open bud? One of Behzad's fellow students, asked to illustrate the same story, had seated the lovers, united at last by fate, on a throne lit by lamps listening to the rebab of a wandering musician. He had followed the right way, taught by their teacher. Behazad drew 
the lovelorn Farhad, the peasant desirous of Shirin till the very end, a haughty Shirin, indifferent to all but Kasru. He drew a great mass of rock, a dark monster rising from the ocean. The peasant was carving a face on the jagged stone, the face of Shirin with fierce rage striking the immovable, shattering with demonic might, showering his subject with blows, his face full of anger, as if he was rescuing his love from the dark veil of the rock, setting her free. Mirsai Dali studied the page for a long while. Why didn't you draw the lovers? Because Behzad bit his lips, then spoke in the voice of Zuleikha, his stepmother. The brush hasn't the tongue to speak the secret of love. A rare gleam entered the elderly teacher's eyes. Of course, Behzad fails to become the chief artist of Akbar, which is the story of the novel. He's expelled, he's thrown out from Akbar's kingdom. And throughout his luck, he asks himself, what is the value of art? What is the true value of art? Wow, that was really interesting. Born in a literary house, how was the growing up environment? And how has it sculpted you as a person, personally and professionally? You know, I was born in a room full of books, literally. I was born accidentally at home. It was not planned to be like that. My mother was finishing a manuscript. You know, and authors can be very compulsive. You know, and she said, I have to finish this book because if I go to the hospital, then I will, won't be able to write for a week at least, maybe two weeks. And my father tried to convince her, no, no, get the, get the child done and then you can come back to the book. He says, no, 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 it'll just take me one more night. I wasn't willing to wait that long. <laughs> and so very early in the morning, uh, my mother realized there was no way. And in those days, you know, you couldn't dial a number and the ambulance wouldn't show up at your door. So my father, like a madman, started running around to find a doctor. And I was born on the floor of our parents' library, gawked at by authors all around me, the books. Okay. Uh, and needless to say, I grew up, grew up in a very bookish family. So we were forever arguing about books and authors. And you know, we would say, I would say, I love this author. My, fa my father would say, it's rubbish, you know? And so from a very early age, my mind was full of words, was full of ideas about novels, etc. But I was distracted along the way and ended up being an academic. What is the inspiration behind your writings? The chief inspiration has to be uh, the, the famous authors I had read growing up, you know. Um, it's not simply uh, Rabindranath, uh, which obviously every Bengali by force has to read, <laughs> um, but authors from all over the world. And when I was young, the, the curious thing is, when I was young, I did not want to read English. You know, I only read in Bengali. And my, my parents tried all kinds of tricks, and they would try to bribe me and say, you know, read this book, it's good. But I never read them. And I read the world classics in Bengali translation. So for a long period of time, I thought Charles Dickens was a Bengali, you know, because I read him in translation, you see. Uh, so uh, my, my inspiration are the, the great authors from all over the world, you know, and uh, they inspire me, they inspire me to write. Who in particular is your muse to write um, Well, inspirationally it is Definitely Bunkim Chandu Chattopadhyay, the great Bengali writer. Um, what he has as a novelist is amazing. First of all, he has great stories. He has very intriguing and interesting settings. Some of them are historical. He has characters to die for. You know, uh, He writes dialogue better than any dialogue writer in Mumbai. Yeah. <laughs> You know, his great climax and their twists and turns in plot. What more do you want as a writer? So, as a muse, uh, he's Bunkim Chandu Chattopa, the 19th century writer, is certainly my muse. Uh, in terms of a living person, um, I have to grudgingly say it's my wife. 
the subjects of your novels, whether it's the opium clock or the e yellow emperor's cure, to your more recent novel, Calcutta, they are all so disparate. What catapults such writing? Um, you know, for many authors, writing novels or short stories is a way of telling the stories of their own lives. So many, many, many parts, uh, pieces of fiction are actually um, camouflaged autobiography. Yeah. It is certainly not so in my case. Yeah. I'm really attracted by the strange, not the familiar. You know, um, my, my publisher and my, my agent in, in the UK would always say, Kunal, why don't you write a contemporary uh, novel set in Kolkata? You were born and raised in that city. Yeah. It took me 17 years of my life as a practicing writer to finally write Calcutta, which is a novel set in Kolkata. Because I'm actually bored by what I know. I'm excited by what I don't know. You know? So if you think about Udaipur in my novel, okay, in, in a short story, the Japanese Wife Collection has a short story called The Snake Charmer. It's a story about an American man in his late 60s who has lost his wife, who he dearly loved. You know, the, I was just saying the greatest tragedy of life is, the greatest tragedy of life is uh, for people who are married that one of the spouses will go before the other. We can't avoid it. You know? And this man suffers terribly from that loss and he decides to take his life. And when his wife was alive, the two of them had planned and they had said, we must one day visit Rajasthan because it is paradise on earth. Okay? And it's looked at brochures of the Lake Palace Hotel set as a jewel in the Pachola, in the Pachola Lake. Okay? And they said, we must visit there. So when he decides to end his life, he decides to come to Udaipur lock himself up in a hotel, in, a, in the room of the Lake Palace Hotel and he wants to commit suicide. What a strange connection between Udaipur and this man who lives in America. Of course he is unable to kill himself and is saved by a young woman, a snake charmer's daughter, who jokingly picks up the gun from his hand and drops it in the lake. But in your recent book, Calcutta, you have given an insight about the gigolos in the city. Did you face any kind of resistance or difficulty doing the research for this book? Oh boy, this was the most difficult research that I ever did. And once I thought of the story, I said, why on earth did you have to think about this strange, strange plot? You know? Let me tell you, tell you briefly how it came about and then I'll tell you uh, again very briefly what the difficulties were. You know, I like to walk and I like to walk wherever I can and if I can't, then I will go in our car. So when I was walking around some parts of Kolkata, central Kolkata, uh, and there are these small little lodges uh, where foreigners come and stay, usually backpackers. You know, it's a place near your, like your old town, near Jagdish Mandir and that part where you've got these small lodges and foreigners, backpackers come and stay. And I saw these young men, very good looking sitting on motorcycles, smelling of good perfume, wearing you know, gold uh, uh, jewelry, expensive watches. I was saying, who are they? And why are they waiting here? So I got friendly with a, a stall owner who was selling juice, fruit juice. And I said, in look one hai? I said, sir, in look tourist guide hai. So when these foreigners come, they take them around and take them to different places. I said, aur kya karte hai? And I, I said, well, agar koi drugs works, so if they want any drugs, they supply drugs to these travelers. Or or kya karte hain log? They say, or dusra kuch seva lage to hain log. So I understood that these were male prostitutes. Now, I was born and raised in Kolkata. I never knew there were people like this who live. You know, I mean, one reads about that, you know. But I said, there must be a story here. And I need to understand these people, I need to meet them, I need to find out about their lives. Not simply their profession, in this profession, but about their families. And that started the research, which was incredibly hard because 
Um, these boys, and I call them young boys, they didn't want to speak, they didn't want to uh, reveal their identity. Because many of them, are, most of them are married, and their wives don't know, their parents don't know, their neighbors don't know. You know. But gradually, I'm a very persistent writer, so if I want to research something, I will eventually get to it. I took help from the police, uh, help from journalists, uh, but I basically started calling them, meeting them, and eventually found out the story of their life, uh, and which is what led to Calcutta. Amazing. Moving from one novel to another, and so different from each other, the transition, is it an easy slip? Um, let, me, let me answer it in the following way. I think of chemical imbalance in my brain. <laughs> the, reason, the reason I say that is because I'm forever dreaming up stories. I'm forever daydreaming. So if I'm sitting in, the, in my hotel room and gazing out of the window at Fateh Sagar, my mind is probably daydreaming and is going somewhere. If I'm waiting at the airport, waiting to catch my flight, my mind is daydreaming. Okay. And that process of daydreaming is what gives birth to stories. So there are lots of stories in my mind, and when I finish a book, I'm actually itching to go over to the next one, to tell another story. So the transition is usually not very long, but I have to train my mind to get away from the novel that I've just written and move into a completely different novel. The Japanese Wife, the movie made based on the short stories you wrote in 2008, is much acclaimed. How did it feel when you were approached for it to be made into a movie? I mean, it came about in a very strange way. So we live in Oxford and we, uh, a very elderly um, Indian professor, a very famous professor of history who's now passed away, once invited my wife and I for dinner. And I told him, look, I, I can't come, I have a college event, I'm giving a talk. It's not a good day for us. But he said, oh, you must come. Aparna Sen is going to be coming. And that irritated me. You know. Why do I have to go? Because a film star is going to be at, in attendance. You know. um, and I was grumpy. So my wife said, look Kunal, they're elderly people. They've invited you us for dinner. We should at least go. So let's go after dinner. And I have, you know, have, we'll have cheese and cake and stuff like that. But you know, we should go. So I went, so we went, and I was in a very bad mood. Okay. And the whole house was full of all these guests who had come, and you know, Aparna Sen was there as well. And she walked straight through the crowd at me, and he said, Oh, you are Kunal Bas, you have written The Miniaturist, it's this book. It's my favorite novel, and I always wanted to meet you. Now look, we are all very vain people, you know? <laughs> and uh, I melted. <laughs> my, my irritation disappeared. Okay, and I became very friendly and uh, we started chatting and said, I want to make a love story. But all love stories have been done, you know, Romeo and Juliet, uh, Shirin and Kashru. Uh, love is actually quite boring. And I wasn't pitching a story to her, but I had a glass of wine in my hand and I said, no, wait, I have a love story which is very different. She said, no, tell me. So I told her the story in about 10 minutes and she said, huh? Have you sold it to anyone? Because don't sell it. I want to make this film. And I said, yes, yes. You know, film people say these things. But, you know. <laughs> but it actually happens. And a few months later, she called me and said, look, we have to, uh, you have to give me rights because uh, I'm very good to do it. What was my reaction when I saw the film? I was very lucky because um, oftentimes when you write something and a film is made out of it, uh, it may not quite turn out to be the way that you had written it. And there may be some disappointments. Oh. But in this case, I realized very early on that Aparna's sensibilities about this story and my sensibilities about this story matched. Okay. So I actually was very intrigued, very pleased. It seemed like an out-of-body experience watching this uh, story unfold on screen, the one that I had written on paper. So you were happy about the depiction of your work or uh, I something was. left unsaid? I was actually um, quite satisfied with the depiction of the work. Um, you know, I wish there was a little more of Japan in the film, but then um, 
Aparna explained to me how difficult it is to shoot a film in Japan, you know, with, all, with language difficulties, but also arrangements, managing the process, and um, I forgave her. <laughs> yeah. Are you a romantic at heart? Hugely, hugely, hugely. In fact, the Shakespeare Society had done a collection of essays on my books, and they called it uh, Romancing the Strange, the Fiction of Kunal Basu. So is there any novel which was challenging and yet close to your heart, enough to identify with it, and why? I think Calcutta was. I, I'm not a person who's naturally drawn towards the dark, not naturally uh, drawn, drawn towards the underbelly. You know, there are many Indian writers, or quite a few Indian writers who write in English, who write about the negative aspects of our society. And every society in the world has positive and negative sides to it. And for some strange reason, the world seems to love the negative sides of the Indian experience. Okay? I don't fall in that category. Um, but Calcutta, when the story uh, appeared in my mind, I started identifying with those individuals who have been far less fortunate than I have been, who would want to be, belong to a, it's a, it's a refugee boy who comes, slips in with his family from Bangladesh, and his mother tells him early on in life, become a Calcutta wala, you see. Um, because we are tired of being refugees, you know. Now we must settle down and you must become a real Calcutta wala, okay. And you know, I'm a real Calcutta wala. I was born and raised and I've taken it for granted. Okay. I don't have to be a Calcutta. Well, I am. But I didn't realize that for a lot of people, that is a struggle, that's a challenge, that's a dream. Okay. And I started identifying with it somewhat. So it was a difficult novel to write, um, but uh, it was hugely revealing to me as well. In the same book, you've uh, shown two sides of Kolkata. How do you reconcile with it? or? Are they different? You know, when people talk about Kolkata, they think it's a Bengali city. 56% of Kolkata's population is non-Bengali. 56%. The large parts of Kolkata, where the Bengalis are not the core, they're the periphery. Go to Bara Bazaar, for example. If you go to Zakaria Street in Chitpur, it looks like, it feels like Baghdad. It feels like Cairo. It doesn't feel like a Bengali city, you know. So, like all major metropolises, like Mumbai as well, it is not one city, but many different cities in one, okay. And people who inhabit these different parts of the city, they pass by each other, like planets pass other planets in the darkness, you know, but they never make contact. So, in writing this novel, I tried to see what would uh, inhabitant of one planet feel when he moved into other domains and other regions and other parts of the world. Are you critical about your work? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> <laughs> because in my other life I'm an academic. And as an academic you're trained to be critical. Hmm. Which is why our students hate us. Which is why our PhD students particularly hate us. Uh, so I'm a compulsive um, uh, editor of my own writing, I would keep on drafting and redrafting a full novel at least twice, if not three times. Calcutta is more than a lakh and a half, uh, one and a half, one point five lakh words, and I've written the novel thrice. Okay, so um, uh, it's uh, so that's sort of the nature of close scrutiny, close analysis and saying, well, am I really conveying what I want to convey? Uh, what's working, what's not working? Uh, you know, it, my, my editor in, in, in England, uh, sometimes she gets really uh, angry with me. I say, Kunal, when will you stop? When will this bo book actually go to print? And I would say, soon. It is famously said, traveling makes one a storyteller. Is it true in your case too? Does traveling motivate you or is it the writing is an interesting part of your being? You see, travel has two meanings in my life. Okay? One is travel to research. Okay? So I would go to a place, 
if I if I've located a story there and I wanted to find out more. Okay, so if it's very directed uh, travel, I would only pay attention to the part of the city or the part of the place or aspect of the place uh, which is important for my novel. Okay, but most of my tr uh, travel does not fall in this category. I travel, and travel uh, is a great obsession uh, for me, because travel puts my mind into free flotation. You see, when you're traveling without an agenda, then you've uprooted yourself from your day-to-day -day routine, from your regular life, from your friends, your neighbors, your work colleagues, and, and especially if you've gone to a place which is uh, very different to what you're used to, then your mind floats. Your mind is willing to go anywhere it, it can. And that's the best moment for story creation. Uh, I'll give you one example. So I was in, in Australia, in Perth, during, uh, doing a literary residency for two months. And uh, in the evenings, I would go and sit on the beach uh, by the Indian Ocean. And when you sit in front of an ocean, your mind floats. You know? It's like the, the ocean's currents. And suddenly this story appeared in my mind, which has nothing to do with Australia. It was a story about an accountant, a middle-aged accountant who lives in Delhi. Okay. But in his dreams, he has a very mundane life. There's nothing exciting about that life. Okay. He goes to work, comes back, chats with his wife, watches television. Uh, they, they, uh, they don't have children. Uh, they eat dinner. He falls asleep. Next day he goes to work. But lately, he start, he's starting to have dreams, and in, this, in his dreams, he sees himself as an architect, a Persian architect who designed the Taj Mahal. There's no connection with his life. And he becomes obsessed with this dream. So he starts bunking work and going to the National Archives to look at the architectural plans of the Taj Mahal. Because in his mind, he's an architect from, who'd come from Iran, during Emperor Shah Jahan's rule and designed the Taj Mahal. And this completely messes up his life. Remember, the story came to me in Australia by this, on, on the beach of the Indian Ocean. Okay? It had nothing to do with Australia. But my mind had gone into free flotation. That's the kind of travel I absolutely love. Four of your Bengali books are being translated into English. How different is the reception of books in Bengali cult to an English-speaking crowd? So, just by way of context, um, I think I am, uh, from a literary point of view, a bilingual writer. Now, bear in mind, Bunkim Chandra Chattopadhyay in the 19th century was the only Bengali who had written full-length novels in both English and Bengali. His first novel was an English novel called Raj Bohun's Wife. Uh, nobody, no other Bengali had written uh, in both languages in the 20th century and I'm second after Bunkim Chandra in terms of writing in both languages. And I wanted to do this because I felt that, you know, uh, I've inherited uh, Bengali literary traditions through my mother and through my family as well. Now, Bengali intellectuals can be very snooty, you know, so I was a bit apprehensive when my first Bengali novel came out, uh, that you know, they would sort of turn around and say, but you are a writer who, write in, who writes in English. How come you're writing in Bangla now? Okay. Uh, uh, very fortunately, none of that happened, and it uh, was nominated for the highest um, Bengali uh, literary award, the Anandu Purushkar. So I was saved. Um, but you know, I have another Bengali book coming out this year, and I might not be saved. To balance a career and find the time for authoring novels, how do you find the balance to pilot such distinct professions? You know, I'm, f I'm forever out of balance. You know, balance is a myth. We tell people that you must lead a balanced life. You can't. If you have a driving passion, and particularly for me, writing is an obsession, is a passion for me, uh, my life can't be in balance. So I'm forever sc scratching my head and saying, what am I forgetting? What am I forgetting? You know, because I'm bound to forget some, some things that I was supposed to do. Uh, fortunately, I've been an academic for 35 years and more. So that routine of being a research academic is fairly ingrained in me. You know, my PhD students and the classes that I teach and things like that. 
and also quite fortunately, in a place like Oxford, teaching uh, uh, demands uh, of senior faculty are fairly low. I mean, look, I wouldn't be able to do this had I been an academic in India. I mean, there's no question in my mind. You know. uh, but my colleagues in Oxford, my, the dean of the business school uh, uh, where I work, uh, have um, the tolerance to put up with me, which allows me to do different things. We've only been talking about you as an author. And we all know you have many facets to your personality. So what does Kunal Basu in his heart of heart identify with? An author, an artist, an actor, or an academician? Uh, they're all A's, right? Yes. <laughs> artist, actor, author, academics. You know, I wanted to be an artist when I was growing up. I was a very naughty boy. And my parents, uh, my mother would always worry about me. Uh, and, but she says, uh, but she said that whenever she felt I was going out of control, they would put a piece of paper in front of me and crayons. And I would immediately fall silent. So my primary sensibility is art. I always say this, I have to see something in order to write it. If I were, if you were a character in my novel, I wouldn't start by saying that she's a very successful business entrepreneur in Udaipur. These are the demographics of her life. I would start by describing how we look. Okay. So for me, the visual is very important even when I'm writing. Okay. Um, my first solo exhibition as an artist happened uh, in Kolkata when I was 11 years old. Uh, but I was not very smart. I was not very smart because I, was, I allowed academics to sidetrack my real passion. And you know how middle class Indian families are, right? I mean, they want their children to do well in school. And unfortunately, I was a good student. I scored high marks in subjects I absolutely hated. You know? Uh, which is not a good thing. You know, because it, when you are young, you don't have judgment. You don't have discernment. Huh? And when you have high marks in a subject, people think, oh, you have good marks in math, so you must be an engineer. Okay. So art, definitely primary uh, uh, sensibility for me. Uh, I also have had a very, very brief career in acting. I was a child actor for two of Minal Sen's films. Um, and I had a brief career on, uh, in acting on stage with Utpal Dat. Um, but that too, uh, in, in the 80s, which was a very different acting environment to today, you couldn't put body and soul together purely by acting. And I was getting roles in Bombay um, uh, in my early years, but when I, was when I was reading the scripts, I couldn't see myself singing and dancing around the tree. <laughs> it would have been different today, but... Uh, um, so definitely acting is, is, is important. Uh, the academics happened through an accident. I really didn't want to be, an, I'm an accidental academic. Because once I'd finished my masters in America, I came back to India uh, and started work, uh, acting with Utpal Dattu in, in, in theater. And there was no way that I could sustain that life. There was just no way, because there's no money in theater and, and cinema. And I, in a family get together, I met a gentleman uh, who was a professor of business in America and he said, have you considered doing a PhD in business? I said, what is that? What, is, what, what do you mean by that? And he gave me a few papers to read, and I said, this could work, because I wanted a career which was the least disruptive of the arts, which would allow me to do other things. If I worked in the corporate world, it would be impossible for me to write. If I was a Sarkari, a government servant, it would be impossible for me to write. If I were an entrepreneur, it would be impossible for me to find time. Okay. So I said, look, if I, were, if I became an academic and a successful one in a top research university in the world, then I will be able to manage my time. It will be within my control. Okay. So, yeah. Accidentally, but lucky enough to be established like that as an academician. And it's because uh, whatever one does, uh, one does with commitment. I mean, I wouldn't want to be uh, shortchange my students. I wouldn't want my PhD students or my students in class to feel that he's just tr he's doing this just to make money. I also have to give them whatever I know. 
true. So teaching business at Oxford to writing papers for Ivy Leagues and authoring books, which you already do, what stimulates these different genres of writing? I, I've tried to create a, a kind of a comp compartmentalization in our mind. Look, women do it far better than men. Okay? Women wear multiple hats, right? They're professionals, they manage the home, they manage all kinds of things. We men are usually single-tracked. Okay? So I've tried to draw inspiration from the women of my life. You know, my mother, my, uh, uh, Shushmita, my wife, our daughter, uh, who I have been able to create different chambers in their mind and excelled within each one of them. So when I'm writing academic papers for publication, uh, I assume a different persona almost. And when I'm writing fiction, which is most of the time, I'm a different Kunal Basu. So it's as if these are two different personalities, two different um, beings within one character. It's never too late, they say. So we would like to know what incited you into authoring novels when you were an already established academician. Look, I always knew I wanted to be a writer. And it was a question of finding the right moment for me. Uh, you know, uh, all of us, and I literally mean all of us, have stories to tell. All of us have stories to tell. So why don't we tell them? So I was having this conversation with my agent uh, in, in London, and she's a wonderful lady. And she says, you know what? You write when you're ready. Something happens inside you when you say, this is the moment. And it can happen when you're in your 20s. It can happen when you're in your 50s. Okay. But that moment came to me at, when I was an academic, and I said, look, I've always dealt with books. I've always read. You know? I've always wanted to write. This is the moment for me to write. And that's what, when I wrote my first novel. I could really go on and on and asking you about your writing career, but I'm sure the audience also want to know something about you. So we open it for the Q&A. All right. Hello, Ravi. Sure. You spoke about your book, Kolkata. And um, you said it was like a shift from your, the familiar, which was boring to you, and then you moved to the unfamiliar, which was exciting. But then you talk about the ugly bit also, you know, not everything is fancy and beautiful. So did at any moment of time you felt that you don't want to look at all that and, you know, just be in your safe domain? Or it excited you more to ponder over such things and then get to writing? Actually the latter. You know, because it was so strange a world for me. I mean, there are other things that I've written that are also very different. I mean, I'm not an artist. The miniaturist is about the intimate life of an, of an artist. Okay. I'm not a scientist. Uh, my fourth novel, The Yellow Emperor's Cure, is about a Portuguese doctor who goes to China to find a cure for syphilis in the 19th century because there was no cure for syphilis. And I delved deep into uh, reading medical books because I'm not a trained doctor. Yeah. Um, for this one, it really stretched and took me to a domain of society that I'm un I was unfamiliar with. Okay. But it did not repel me. It actually filled me with empathy. And I always said, look, how would I have reacted if I wasn't born with the kind of facilities that I was born with? Our, our, our births are accidental. You know, we are born into certain families. We could be born into very different kinds of families. So, Although some parts of that existence was ugly, okay, there were also aspects that were very moving and very touching. There were aspects that were completely funny, totally hilarious. So I don't see Calcutta as a dark novel per se. It deals with the underbelly of society, but in the underbelly of society, people still laugh, they still dream, they still fall in love. Thank you. Yeah. 
more exciting and more difficult. Yeah. You know, um, I'll first say a f uh, what Gabriel Garcia Marquez once said. So Marquez said, look, you know, basically a short story and a novel are the same things. You have to tell a story. The short story is slightly more challenging because everything needs to be boiled into a shorter number of words. Okay. Um, the process of story making is the same. So for me, uh, whenever I think of a story, and I said that I'm forever dreaming of stories, the judgment that I have to make is, will I, how long can I spend in the company of this story? You know, a novel is a two-year affair. Yeah. So is, does the story have enough nooks and crannies and byways and scope that will keep me absorbed for two years? You know, it's like, is it a full-blown affair or is it a one-night stand? Okay. Whereas a short story has all kinds of exciting departures and interesting things, but you know you can't live with it for two years. You can probably live with it for three months. Okay? So that's sort of the difference in terms of from a writer's perspective into what becomes a short story and what becomes an novel. We're curious to know about your latest uh, Bengali novel, Tejaswini O Shabnam. Yeah. So we haven't talked about that. Yeah, so the, I'll tell you briefly how it came about. So there was this film, uh, a production company in Mumbai that approached me and said, you know, we want to do a film on trafficking. And I said, you've got the wrong person, you know. Um, because I know it's around, um, I'm saddened by it, I'm angry uh, uh, about trafficking. But this is not a world that, you know, I would necessarily want to enter. But then something struck me. I said, look, why should I say no? Let me try and explore this world a bit. Oh. And I said, look, I need your help. You have to, uh, I want to go to some places. There's a particular part of southern Bengal, which unfortunately sees a lot of trafficking, trafficking of young girls, okay, uh, to, uh, to other cities and even outside India. And they said, yeah, we'll organize that. So Save the Children is an NGO and they partnered with this production company in Bombay and took me to all these different places that I normally would never know of. And one day, armed with my, t uh, my, my phone, my recording device, writing pad, etc., I went to a small village in southern Bengal where young girls who had been rescued from trafficking had, would be waiting for me and I would interview them. They were waiting in a small uh, classroom, in a school. So I go there, for, you know, full of energy, I want to interview, interview them, but when I entered, I couldn't ask a single question. There were these there were little girls, you know, 15, 16 year old, max, 17. They'd been rescued from places as far as Dubai. And my heart sank. What do you ask them? It's the kind of tragedy, the scale of tragedy to me was unbelievable and I started to cry. You know? And all these eyes were watching me, these girls, and the eyes merged into a set of eyes who I called Shabnam later. And it's a story, it's a curious story about two women who meet in the theater of war. They meet in Iraq when the war is going on after the death of Saddam Hussein. The two women are from completely two different uh, parts of society. One of them is a CNN journalist who's grown up in, in New York, has gone to the best of universities, studied journalism in Columbia, is an absolutely uh, uh, fer uh, you know, fearless journalist who goes into war zones and reports for, uh, uh, for CNN. And she has come to uh, Iraq to, uh, to report on the war. Who does she meet there? She meets Shabnam, a young girl trafficked from India, who's doing the rounds in the camp of soldiers. Okay. But there's a deep secret between the two women. And I will reveal it, the, the secret, is, and, and the CNN journalist woman, Tejeshwini, she is very intrigued. Who is this woman? She's not, she's not from Arabia. She's not from here. Is she from India? Why is she here? What is she doing here? How could she get here? And she eventually tracks her down and a very curious friendship develops between these two unlikely women. And what is revealed is both Tejashwini and Shabnam were orphans. 
both were in an sh orphan shelter in South Bengal. One of them was adopted by an NRI couple, Tejashwini, and taken to America. And she had a life. The other, unfortunately, was sold into prostitution. So saving Shabnam becomes Tejashwini's great goal. And the two of them try to escape the war and return to India. That's the story. Um, I think we all love the language Bengali, although we can't understand much, but we just love to hear it. Can you speak a few lines for Udaipur or, you know, maybe how you... Ami Udaipur Bishon Bhalobashi. You can translate that Yeah. I think Bhalobashi is a word that Bengalis use at the drop of a hat. They, they love their fish. Ami Mach Bhalobashi. Thanks the, to the Bollywood songs. Th thanks to Bollywood songs. You know. Although we don't quite like the accent with which Bollywood... <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know, there's a huge connection. I have to say this because I was telling her uh, when we first chatted about this, that there's a tremendous connection between Rajasthan and Bengal, which is a literary connection. So, Obonindranath Thakur, who was Robindranath's nephew, and a famous painter, artist, who started the Bengal School of Art, in Shantini Ketan was also a writer and he wrote a book called Raj Kahini okay, which every Bengali girl or boy growing up reads okay? and we know the Raj Kahini by heart and the Raj Kahini is a set of stories about the Rajputs okay? so we know about Padmini much before Padmavat okay? we know about uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the Mewar, the kingdom of the Mewars and all of that uh, and Rajasthan is very much, the lords of Rajasthan is very much a part of Bengalis growing up through literature. Yeah. It was an absolute delight listening to you, Calcutta too. So it was just a, you know, down memory lane. It was so much fun visiting Calcutta again with you. Um, it was interesting the story you described about your new Bengali book that immediately struck Umrao Jan, the film. If you see the film Umrao Jan, it is the same. Umrao Jan had her friend, and both of them um, were being sold, and one was picked up by a prosperous family, and you know, Umrao Jan became Umrao Jan thereafter. Yeah. So very interesting. Uh, I want to know that uh, when you write in English and Bengali, you said, what is it that, which language finds better expression for your word and why and um, I have another question for you when when you wrote that book Kolkata uh, I also want to understand it was a refugee um, you spoke of the stories around the life of a refugee so um, what is your take on the refugee problem or condition or situation that we are in and uh, you know Mamta Banerjee is there she's you know, uh, obviously, uh, it's been told that, you know, she's been responsible for so many refugees coming into India and it contributes to a great deal of trouble. So just what is your idea? How would you look at it? Yeah, the, the second first, and then I'm going to talk about Bangla and English uh, also. You know, I've literally grown up in the U.S. Um, and then s now spent the last 20 years in the U.K. Uh, in the U.S. is this great uh, narrative about how immigrants uh, come uh, and you know, some people like that and present dispensation hates immigrants. And I always tell my foreign friends, uh, there's no other society on earth which is as friendly to refugees as India. Think about Tibetans, think about people from erstwhile East Pakistan and then Bangladesh, think about Afghans uh, and everywhere. Uh, India absorbs people from many different parts, many different cultures, many different religions, many different backgrounds. And that speaks to the broadness of the Indian mind, which is unparalleled in this world. And uh, what I feel about that is no human being willfully leaves home unless forced to do so. Okay? Unless they face circumstances where their lives are imperiled, their families are imperiled. And so I have huge empathy for refugees. Do the, does the, um, the passage of refugees into a society create societal uh, problems, tensions, uh, and challenges? Of course they do. 
Okay. But that is equally true for people going from one region of the country to another region of the country. You know? uh, but I'm all in favor of, uh, of empathy, all in favor of treating people with respect and dignity, which India has historically. You know? The Dalai Lama came to our country right? and made it home. And aren't we all proud of the Dalai Lama? Yeah. The, uh, the first question, Bangla and English. You know, I am from a generation of Bangalis, uh, especially uh, uh, those who have, been, who have grown up in a cultural milieu, where uh, there was no contradiction between English and Bengali's literary languages. So we've literally grown up with two streams flowing through our heart. And we could jump from one stream to another stream without seeking anybody's permission. Okay. So when I s thought about writing my first novel in English, never for a moment did I think, oh, can I, should I write in English? W would it turn out right? Would I be able to convey what I really wanted to convey? And equally, after so many years writing in English, when I wrote my first novel in Bangla, I never hesitated for a moment because I took the sanction of my cultural heritage. Okay. See, Rabindranath wrote brilliantly in both languages. He wrote non-fiction. Michael Mandushudan Dotto wrote poetry and plays in both languages brilliantly. Okay? Nobody had written full-length novels, and so I can claim credit for that. But uh, uh, w the only judgment that I need to make about Bangla and English when a story appears in my mind is which language is this story best expressed in? So my agent in London, for example, said, Tejushwini and Ushabnam, why didn't you write it in English? It's such a global story. It's about friendship between women, which is a very important thing. It's friendship between women from completely two different backgrounds. Okay. Um, but somehow, when I conceived of the story in my mind, the images that I saw, the lines that I kept hearing in my ear, okay, the words that I kept hearing in my ear were in Bangla. You know? Equally, Calcutta could have been written in Bangla. But when I started researching uh, Zakaria Street and Chitpur and Bara Bazaar and things like that, okay, I, the words that came to me came to me in English. So there is no formula, you know. There is no uh, magic marker that will move me one, one to the other. It's an instinctive creative judgment. The only source of knowledge is experience. And today, we have enlightened ourselves in the illustrious company of a great writer. Thank you, Dr. Kunal Basu, for being so generous in sharing your colossal creative space with us. You made it so easy to feel every emotion in the spectrum. We are fortunate to have found the virtues of, a verac of veraciousness and quality of a wizard in a grey-haired Bengali personality. We are so happy to have you. I request my friend Kanika to present a token of gratitude to Dr. Basu. I extend a big thank you to Prabha Khaitan Foundation for this literary venture. Thank you Radisson Blue for your warm hospitality. I humbly thank the media for being there by helping us take the word of art and literature forward in the region. I sincerely thank all of you, our dear friends, for, en for the encour encouragement and your valuable presence. I now request the members of SR's Women to step forward for a group photograph, post which each one of you may collect a copy of the book and have it signed by the author himself. Thank you very much. Have a great, have a wonderful evening. <laughs>